Adopting a child from foster care can be wonderful. It helps thousands of children in foster care find permanent families. Often the children come from unstable homes or have families that aren't able to meet their needs. Adoption also allows adults to experience parenthood, sometimes due to infertility or medical complications, or in today's case, couples in same-sex relationships, having biological children is not an option. So adoption is an alternative to starting a family together and sharing their life with a child. It can lead to rewarding and meaningful relationships between a parent and a child and provide loving and stable homes to children who need them. At least that's the hope. Of course, there are always the outlying horror stories you hear about children being placed with their forever families only to have them turn into forever nightmares as they endure physical and or verbal abuse. It's chilling that in a home that's supposed to be filled with love and support, some children experience terrible tragedies from the people they're supposed to be able to trust. And today's episode focuses on a particularly gruesome case that involves the mistreatment of two boys by the hands of their very own adoptive parents. My name is Lucy, and on today's episode of Killer Bites, we're looking at a case involving two young boys, brothers, from the foster care system. They were supposed to be placed in their forever home, but it turned out to be a house of nothing but terror and abuse for them, all inflicted by their own adoptive parents, William and Zachary Zulak. I'd like to warn viewers that the story I'm about to talk about contains a lot of graphic content on very sensitive subject matters such as pedophilia, child sexual abuse, and child pornography. Here on Killer Bites, we want to handle the information we share with respect, but we strongly advise viewer discretion. I would also like to mention that this case is still ongoing. Court proceedings are still taking place and evidence is still being reviewed. And because of that, a lot of the information we have is currently only alleged. On the night of July 27th, 2022, in Loganville, Georgia, police entered the home of William and Zachary Zulak. They were a married couple and adoptive parents of two brothers, ages 11 and 9. The authorities were there because they had evidence that suggested the parents were responsible for sexually abusing and assaulting their own sons. Not only that, but it was also believed that the two men were responsible for recording the abuse through photography and film and distributing it among other sexual predators in the surrounding area. It was around 11.30 p.m. when the police arrived at the Zulak residence. Zachary, who was 35 years old, answered the door and the police immediately took him into custody. They slammed him to the ground and handcuffed him. They found his partner, 33-year-old William, in bed. William was sleeping without clothes on, so at the time of the arrest, he was taken out of his home and escorted to a squad car completely nude. There, he would wait until around 4 a.m. when the authorities raided his house. Then, he and Zachary were transported to the county jail around 4 a.m. The two boys were also found and taken in for a sexual assault medical forensic examination, also known as a SANE exam. During each of their evaluations, the nurse performing the exam did find evidence that suggested the boys had been sexually violated. They even found injuries on the 11-year-old that were a result of being sexually assaulted. The police came prepared with a warrant which allowed them to seize any and all assets of the Zulocks to look for evidence. This included the house, any cars parked in the driveway, and any possessions on the property. As they searched the house, they found more horrific evidence linking William and Zachary as perpetrators to the two boys' abuse. They found dozens of files on a computer, both photos and videos documenting the tortures and abuse the boys had to endure. On top of that, they also got access to cell phone data and found on Zachary's phone a folder labeled Us. On it was even more photo and video evidence of sexually explicit materials involving the two boys. What's even more disturbing is that often William appeared in the recordings or pictures participating or forcing the boys to engage in these inappropriate acts. And it looked like Zachary was the one behind the camera. The parents, the ones these boys were supposed to call their family, were allegedly the very people exploiting them. In the end, the detectives were able to obtain 149 photos, two flash drives with William and Zachary's cell phone data, two handwritten letters from the oldest son, the SANE exam results for both boys, and they even found clothing in the boys' closets that matched the clothing the boys in the video were wearing. Some of the photos and videos dated all the way back to the year 2019, which meant these boys had supposedly been experiencing this abuse for years. The evidence was quickly stacking up against William and Zachary, and by the end of the raid, the two culprits had racked up a total of 17 charges against them. Authorities found that many of these materials had been shared via email or messaging systems with other male predators. They also found evidence that suggests William and Zachary pimped out their own kids to a network of other pedophiles. Two of those predators were Hunter Clay Lawless and Luis Armando Viscaro Sanchez. 
Both men were arrested for soliciting an act of sales with a human, and they also lived in the Loganville area. It remains unclear if either of them ever physically met the boys or had any sexual interactions with them. However, both men were facing other charges of child sex crimes as well. Plus, the police were actually able to identify the Zulocs as sexual predators because of Hunter. You see, earlier that very same day, the police received an alert from a software program designed to detect when large amounts of data containing child pornography or explicit materials containing minors is being accessed and or downloaded. The user was 27-year-old Hunter. Having taken him into custody, custody and interrogated him, Hunter told the authorities about a man named Zachary. He met him through a mutual friend and soon after they connected, Hunter started receiving several messages from Zachary containing explicit materials with a young boy. It's unclear whether Hunter was motivated to talk about his involvement by a plea deal, however, he talked about his interactions with Zachary, which he said were brief. Hunter claimed that it was Zachary who instigated conversations and that it was Zachary who boasted that the young boy in the videos and pictures he sent him were of his own son. Once, Hunter claimed that he received Snapchat messages from Zachary that said he was going to sexually abuse his son that night and that Hunter should stand by. Later, Zachary allegedly sent documentation of him doing exactly what he said he would. Hunter said he received numerous invitations from Zachary to join them and even messages that solicited the boys themselves. Soliciting them like objects or property and not like a human being, let alone your own family member. But again, Hunter insisted that he never met the boys in person. Knowing that both the victims and the supposed perpetrators were living at the same residence, the police were able to find the Zulok's home address and obtain a warrant. The other predator, a 25-year-old man named Luis, had his own unrelated charges, which included a charge that suspected him of coercing a 13-year-old into sex, who was his own relative. Still other unidentified men are being investigated, based on the computer and cell phone evidence the police were able to collect. Now, it may surprise you that when this story first came to light, it wasn't covered by many news outlets. This could be for many reasons. Some critics say it's related to bipartisan issues and media control, while others suggested it could be because of the graphic and violent nature of the crime. Especially when it comes to dealing with an assault on a minor, it's important to not only report the news, but to protect the victims and keep them safe. All public records have redacted the two boys' names to protect their identities. Regardless of why it was or was not covered by the news channels at the time, in August 2022, the news source Town Hall released a four-part investigative article about the Zulok case. It revealed some horrifying things. So let's start with the perpetrators. William and Zachary met in 2013. They seemed like the perfect couple, both highly influential social media influencers and gay rights activists. They could often be seen in Instagram posts at rallies, parades, or other events supporting LGBTQ causes. They were even featured in Out Magazine, a popular queer-centered publication, for a campaign they participated in advocating for same-sex marriage and LGBTQ rights. Zachary's Instagram profile, which is still available to view to the public but hasn't been active in several months, has a large array of uplifting and affirming photos and posts. He posted a picture of himself and William posing at the Atlanta Pride Parade. In another, the couple pose on their date night, Zachary wearing a rainbow-colored Sun Trust t-shirt, a bank where he worked as a branch coordinator. They participated in AIDS Walk Atlanta for several years. People sometimes referred to them as the darlings of the local LGBTQ community. They often tagged their posts with hashtag gay, hashtag love wins, or hashtag love is love. Four years later, on December 14th, 2017, Zachary and William were married. Zachary posted several times that week, showing off the ceremony, the wedding party, and the professional wedding photos he and William posed for. In a video post, they kicked off the ceremony with the wedding party walking down the aisle to Shania Twain's From This Moment On. It seemed like a beautiful and picture-perfect wedding for a happy couple. It wasn't long after the wedding that the couple looked to start a family together. The Zulocs looked into going through the adoption process with a Christian adoption agency known as All God's Children. It is now defunct, but it specialized in connecting parents with children with special needs. On March 26, 2018, the couple hosted an adoption shower. The banner photo for the event had a chalkboard in a garden with the message written, We're growing by four feet. Two pairs of adult shoes and two pairs of children's shoes adorned the sides of it. Zachary and William had been matched with two little boys. They were brothers, ages seven and nine. They were originally placed in the foster care system when they were three and five, taken from a home with parents that had issues with substance abuse. In the event description, they wrote, the adoption process is moving along faster than expected. This puzzled many people. The process only took approximately eight to 12 weeks before they were matched, whereas a typical adoption process can take anywhere from six months to over six years. Nonetheless, William and Zachary went through criminal background checks, attended mandatory pre-adoption parenting classes, 
completed a family assessment, and had a social worker conduct a home study all within an expedited timeline. I guess maybe the agency looked at the couple and thought they could provide stable physical and financial care for the boys, but it still raises the question, why were they matched so quickly? On November 7th, 2018, they met their new kids and Zachary took to Facebook posting the exciting news. On Wednesday, November 7th, 2018, at 8.30 a.m., the adoption is completely finalized and we will be a forever family. Hashtag Zoolock home. Again, the Zoolock's digital footprint painted the picture of two loving parents who were excited to grow as a family. But if the allegations are true, their family turned out to be so far from that picture-perfect social media persona. On May 22nd, 2019, Zachary announced on Instagram that they'd purchased land to build their new home with their new family. A photo accompanied it of the couple posing against a wooden fence. Behind them, a large, beautiful, but barren landscape. Again, time seemed to be on their side because within six months of starting construction, a giant mansion sitting on a two-acre secluded cul-de-sac in a prestigious neighborhood of Walton County was built. This posed another red flag for people since other houses in the neighborhood were said to be sold at over $900,000. At the time, William worked as a government worker and Zachary worked at a bank as a branch coordinator. And $900,000 seems like that would be a little out of a government worker and a bank coordinator's price range. The family also took numerous trips together, visiting tourist attractions all across America. The couple posted photos of the boys at The Bean in Chicago, a selfie in front of the Human Rights Campaign headquarters in Washington, DC, and a trip to a cabin in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. On the husband's social media pages, you can see they decorated their home with uplifting quotes about love and acceptance. Their couch was decorated with rainbow throw pillows, all saying, love above all. They had a light up neon sign that read love is love and their welcome mats adorning the doors were cute little quips like gayest place in town and it's basically a zoo in here. I'm not saying that a family with two parents working stable jobs can't go on vacation or have a nicely furnished home, but their online presence definitely had some people curious about how they could afford what seemed like a lavish lifestyle. As time passed, the Zoolocks shared life updates. William posted on his Instagram account, which has since been removed, celebrating their one-year anniversary as a family. In it, himself, Zachary, and the boys all posed wearing matching shirts that said Zoolock 2019. In his caption, he wrote, It's been just over a year as their parents. We have loved every moment of it. Was a little rough starting out, but we beat the one-year mark. This was our second year to the ocean. Last year was the first time they've seen it. I just love how this picture turned out. Our little hashtag adoption family. It's especially disturbing to remember that the evidence the police found dated as early as 2019, which means it's very plausible that already, only a year into being placed in their new home, these boys were enduring the unspeakable. In 2019, Zachary posted photos of the boys, both holding school certificates. Their faces were censored by their parents, and at the time, they were in first and second grade. This is when the abuse was alleged to have started. And on November 7th, 2021, Zachary posted on Facebook celebrating the family's third year of being together. I can't help but think that instead of that date marking what was supposed to be the happiest day of these kids' lives, it might actually mark the day they were betrayed. If these allegations are true, everything was so far from what it seemed. It surprised everyone that this was supposedly all just a front, hiding unimaginable horrors behind glitzy and happy posts. But how could this all have happened? How could two boys fall into the hands of such terrible parents, and how could their abuse go on for so long unnoticed? During investigations, a source shared that William and Zachary had allegedly told the boys, our business is our business, and what happens in our home stays in our home. These kids probably felt trapped and thought they couldn't turn to anyone. Authorities also found Instagram messages from Zachary reaching out to the woman that had originally helped them out with their first adoption. In the text chain, Zachary wrote that they were interested in trying to adopt another child. This time they were looking for a little girl, toddler aged. Can you believe that? I mean, why did they feel the need to extend the abuse? This was back in October of 2021, almost a year from when these men would be caught. The woman informed him that the agency had closed, but that wouldn't stop the Zoolocks. Zachary then asked if she could refer him to a different agency. I don't have any sources that suggest he ever contacted any of the sources she gave him, but I just can't understand how this couple could continue to abuse their children and decide they needed another child to inflict harm upon. According to the 17 count indictment against both William and Zachary Zulock, the charges included incest, aggravated sodomy, aggravated child molestation, felony sexual exploitation of children, and felony prostitution of a minor. During court proceedings, evidence continued to reveal itself. In an interview, William confessed in a sworn affidavit that he forced the 11-year-old boy to perform an oral act with the intent to satisfy his own sexual desire. Zachary admitted to sending child material to multiple people, but phrased it as less than a dozen, as if sending it to only one person would have been okay. It also came to light that Zachary had a previous sexual assault charge also against a minor. 
Back in 2011, when Zachary would have been 24 years old, he allegedly lured a 14-year-old boy into a residence before assaulting him. This took place in Walton County, the same county as the child sexual abuse case took place. So how did this not come up in the criminal background check he had to undergo during the adoption process? Well, apparently this case just fell through the cracks of the justice system, which sounds absurd to me. How can someone who's even suspected as a child predator be overlooked when it comes to adopting a child? The case was 11 years cold at this point, and when prosecutors tried to trace it back to the original investigators assigned to it, they found that they were all retired. However, they were able to contact one of the current detectives of the Criminal Investigations Division, Lieutenant Zachary Barrett. He commented that the 2011 case was handled in a manner that is inconsistent with today's current investigatory standards. He agreed to reopen the case and look into any possible leads that could lead to more charges being made against Zachary. In addition to the sexual abuse, an anonymous source said that the boys were also subjected to physical abuse. That source spoke out against William and Zachary and said the kids were forced to stand in the corner, sometimes for eight hours or more, as punishment. During that time, they weren't allowed to move unless it was time to eat or they had to use the bathroom. Another source said they witnessed William slap one of the boys across the face. Judge Jeffrey L. Foster is presiding over this horrific case, and at first, attorney John Haldy was hired to represent both William and Zachary. They filed for bond, however, Judge Foster denied their motion. He concluded that the two Zulok men were a threat to the community and children and could intimidate or influence witnesses or victims related to the case. He also wanted the couple to be tried separately. He ordered that William and Zachary be kept at separate facilities and be represented by different attorneys. He said the men would have to testify against each other and he removed their right to claim immunity. This means the defendants couldn't use the excuse that since they were married, they shouldn't have to testify against each other. So Zachary was moved to the Barrow County Detention Center while William remains at Walton County Jail. Their shared attorney, Haldi, withdrew his support for Zachary and remained as William's legal representation. Zachary has been trying to find a private attorney, but because of his seized assets and lack of funds, he's finding it difficult. Although they're being kept in separate facilities, both Zachary and William have communicated with some mutual contacts. They were given allotted phone calls as well as tablet devices that had software called Jail ATM installed. This app allows friends and family to stay in contact with inmates. Users can email, video chat, and send monetary funds. They both used it to talk to a shared relative and both complained about their treatment in jail. William, who's lactose intolerant, said he couldn't eat most of the food in the cafeteria and the stuff he could eat he claimed wasn't high quality enough. I don't even know a dog would eat these bologna sandwiches. That's how low grade the meat is, he said. He also called the housing conditions decrepit. When the relatives asked about some of the charges, William got teary eyed and said, all I can say is, um, I don't wanna say it, but brace yourself for the truth. William also expressed concern for Zachary, saying that his partner was an emotional person and probably wasn't taking this all very well. And he was right. In the neighboring county, Zachary was also messaging about his time in jail. I was just threatened again, Zachary wrote, to physically beat me or have someone do it for him. He said he had been getting threats from his cellmates and even drugged at one point. He suspected that one of his fellow inmates slipped something in his drink because at one point someone offered him something and he didn't accept it. Then later the inmate asked him if he wanted another. Zachary said, another one? I've never had one before. He then claims that his arm went numb and he experienced what he thought to be stroke-like symptoms. He insisted that he be taken to a hospital and be evaluated for a stroke. Instead, he was taken to the medical wing of the facility and given a When he was asked about if he was worried about the kids, Zachary said he was, but quickly moved on to, I guess, what he thought was more pressing matters like his finances. He rambled on about payments on the house and the seizure of his assets and how it was going to affect him. He even started going down a mental list of subscriptions he needed to cancel so that he wouldn't get charged for it. I'll admit it's hard to sympathize with these men. To complicate things further, Judge Foster had to issue a gag order which restricts what information can be released to the public and what certain people involved in the case can say. Why? Because the shared contact William and Zachary had was leaking their text chains and phone conversations to the public and it wasn't making them look good. The couple were shocked, but I mean, come on, you're being held in a prison for committing crimes. Are you really surprised that your calls are being monitored? By this time, months of recorded jailhouse calls were already made available. In one message, Zachary pleaded that he be released on bond. He said, tell the DA that I want an ankle monitor and if required, a low bond amount. Does he really think he has the power to negotiate that and that he can request a low bond amount? Zachary also admitted to some of the physical abuse charges he heard were against him. Using jail ATM, he wrote that he knew they weren't supposed to physically abuse the boys since they were told that it was illegal before when they were in the process to adopt. 
So I guess the Zulocs just thought making the boys stand in the corner for hours on end was an appropriate alternative since they weren't hitting them. I don't know what was going through their heads, and this isn't the only loophole Zachary tried to construct. While he was in pre-trial detainment, apparently he tried to get around the system security and contact an old coworker of his undetected. He hand wrote a letter, took a picture of it, then using another inmate's tablet, sent it to the former colleague. However, it was still leaked. In the letter, Zachary revealed some of his legal strategies, if you can still even call them that. Without representation from an attorney, he was desperate to get out on bond. He wanted to claim that the night of the raid, the police used excessive and brutal force when they entered the home. He was asking for body camera footage, if it existed, to back up his argument. He also brought up the rule of sequestration and wanted to use it against the officer that interviewed him that night. Rule of sequestration is used to ensure that witnesses do not discuss the facts of the case or their testimony with other witnesses before appearing at trial. He claimed that the officer threatened him and wouldn't answer his questions. Zachary was also requesting that his coworker look at old cases regarding similar subject matter when it came to the seizure of their property and their assets. He seemed a lot more concerned with his stuff than he did for the actual crimes he was accused of committing. Zachary also asked about estoppel and nolo contendere plea. The former allows the court to prevent a person from making claims or from going back on their word. The latter roughly translates to no contest, and by taking this plea in court, Zachary would accept the conviction but would not admit guilt for his crimes. This guy was really set on trying to beat the court at their own game, when he really should have just been concerned with the actual charges he was accused of. It got to a point where Zachary even tried to reach out to the Walton County District Attorney himself and arrange a bond or plea deal without a lawyer. Many of the leaked messages from William's side seemed to express concern for Zachary. Multiple times, William asked their relative to relay messages to his partner that he missed him or that he loved him. But as Zachary tried to weave his complicated web of supposed loopholes, the court started getting irritated. In one message, William wrote, please tell him to slow down and he can't rush any of this and he needs to take some of my patience. And don't get fooled by what seems like a partner caring for the other just yet. Soon the couple even started turning on each other. At one point, William claimed Zachary was a pedophile and that he was engaging in these types of activities even before they had met. Meanwhile, Zachary claimed it was actually William who began targeting the children. Regardless of who started it, neither of these men stopped the other. Neither thought to protect the boys. Judge Foster called out the pair, saying he didn't think it was likely that Haldi was the one blabbing to the public about the details of the case. He said, my instinct is that much of what is out there was conversation that was assumed to be in confidence that obviously was not held in confidence. But I don't think William took a hint because immediately after the proceedings, he got on his tablet and messaged the very person who was leaking their conversations. Someone is leaking our phone calls, texts, and emails. I've only talked about certain things with few people. I hope none of our family members are doing this to us. Zachary also wasn't picking up the clues because he wrote, the DA mentioned a gag order at court on William. Don't know what that's about. Nobody, not just William, both of you. As of today, William and Zachary are each facing over nine life sentences and they've pleaded not guilty. Their court date was scheduled for March, 2023. However, no sources are available regarding the outcome of either's trials. Hunter, one of the men who received solicitations from Zachary was released on a $25,000 bond. Meanwhile, the other man police had in custody for performing acts of prostitution, Luis, remains in jail and is awaiting trial. The boys were relinquished from William and Zachary's care and returned to foster care. By now they're 12 and 10, and I can't fathom what it must have been like to return to the foster care system after everything they'd been through. As this case has grown in notoriety, people are outraged and horrified. Many directed a lot of their disgust towards the queer identities these men have. They ask how they were able to adopt, especially from a Christian-based adoption agency. However, at the end of the day, adoption decisions should be based on what is best for the child. Abusive parenting is wrong regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or religious beliefs. If we were holding interest in parents by some of the rigid standards and definitions people have against sexual orientation, then we wouldn't let a Catholic couple or a gay couple or even a couple who supported Boy Scouts adopt a child because all of these factors have contributed to child molestation in some form. It's important to remember that this type of abuse is not exclusive to one particular community. Horrific examples of child abuse can be found across the social spectrum. It's something we all have to be fighting against, and any person considering adoption, regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or religious beliefs, need to have a psychological background test. They need to be vetted before they're given the responsibility of caring for a child. As this episode comes to a close, I encourage everyone to be kind to one another and stay safe. Thank you for watching, and join me next time on Killer Bites for more bite-sized coverage on the most chilling true crime cases.